Welcome to Haven Heights Baptist Church. Welcome to those who are here and welcome to those listening online. There's a few announcements in your bulletin, and so please be sure to check those out before you leave this morning. Let us take a moment to prepare our hearts for worship. Our call to worship comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verse 36. Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. The word of our God.
stand with me. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood when all around my soul gives way he then is all my hope and stay on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, all else to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. We've a story to tell to the nations that shall turn their hearts to the right. A story of truth and mercy, a story of peace and light, a story of peace and light. For the darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. We've a song to be sung to the nations that shall lift their hearts to the Lord, a song that shall conquer evil and shatter the sphere and sword and shatter the sphere and sword for the darkness shall turn to dawning and the dawning to noonday bright and christ's great kingdom shall come on earth the kingdom of love and light we've a message to give to the nations that the lord who reigneth above hath sent us his son to save us and show us that god is love and show us that god is love for the darkness shall turn to dawning and the dawning to noonday bright and christ 
Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, a kingdom of love and light. We've a Savior to show to the nations who the path of sorrow hath trod, that all of the world's great peoples may come to the truth of God, may come to the truth of God, for the darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright, and Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. You may be seated. When Jesus stood trial, he spoke to an earthly king, and he said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Let's pray together. Father God, this morning we gather together to thank you for Jesus. And we thank you that Jesus has come to us, and we thank you that Jesus has died for us. And this morning, we gather to specifically praise you that your Son is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we thank you that Jesus is the everlasting King. And we thank you that he is the King of heaven and the King of earth. And we thank you that he is the King who reigns in mercy and justice. We thank you that he is the only wise king, the God eternal. Father God, we gather this morning because your son, the king, is worthy of our allegiance. Father, in these uncertain times, would you remind us that your son is seated at your right hand, ruling and reigning. Remind us that because he is on the throne, we have nothing to fear. Father, this morning, we praise you for the perfect king. And we also pray for our earthly kings. We pray for our president. And we pray for the president-elect. And we pray for our senators. And we pray for our congressmen. And Father, we pray that their leadership would be a reflection of your perfect leadership. And we pray that you would cause them to rule in mercy and justice. And Father, we pray for our leaders. And when they are tempted to rule in ways that are not aligning with your kingdom. And they're tempted to rule in ways that are harsh. And they're ru ruling in ways that are unmerciful. Father, we pray that you would stop their plans. And we pray that you would turn them towards you. And Father, this morning we rest in your good promise that all things work together for good for those who love you. Father, we pray that in these uncertain times, we pray that your promise would go deep in our hearts and that we would believe you this morning. Father, this morning we pray for the preaching of your word and we pray that you would build and establish faith and we pray that we would believe in you with greater confidence this morning. We pray not only would you stir our minds, but we also pray that you would stir our passion. We pray that you would cause us to live for you with greater fervency and greater holiness. We pray that you would use these tithes and these offerings to spread your fame this morning. We pray that many would hear of your gospel from this pulpit this hour. We pray that many would turn towards you in faith and repentance. And we pray that you would receive all of the glory. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Good morning. Let's continue our worship together. How 
fell from the hands of those who gave their lives proclaiming that Jesus died and rose. Ours is the same commission, the same good message ours, fired by the same ambition to be our powers. We go to all the world with kingdom hope unfurled. No other name has power to save but Jesus Christ the Lord. Oh, Father, who sustained them, O oh, Spirit, You may be seated. <clears throat> if you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We'll begin in verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every good way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of your, the service by which you have proved yourself, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ, and for your generosity in sharing with them and everyone else. And in the prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The word of our God. Give 
The events at the Capitol on Wednesday were astonishing. What happened on Wednesday barely looked like the United States of America. What happened on Wednesday looked perhaps like a third world country, perhaps a movie, but certainly not our nation. What happened on Wednesday was a group of people desperate, desperate for the president's leadership to continue. Some acted peacefully, some acted violently, but nearly all were desperate. Some were saddened that the president would be leaving office. Others excited that a change of leadership will take place. But here's what I pray that we see this morning. I pray that we see as Christians what happened on Wednesday and what will happen in the coming weeks will not affect the kingdom of Christ. That's my prayer for us. I pray that we see that the events on Wednesday, and no matter what comes our way in the coming days, will not affect the kingdom of Christ. Our king, the one true king, he is on his throne, and his kingdom is not of this world. And as followers of Christ, our primary allegiance isn't to Trump, or our primary allegiance isn't to Biden. Our primary allegiance isn't to the GOP or to the left. Our primary allegiance is to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the King Eternal, the only wise God, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, I suspect that most of us here this morning know that, and I suspect that most of us agree with that. And yet, when Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world, John chapter 18 Jesus is not only proclaiming that he is the one true king above every other king. Jesus is also proclaiming how his kingdom comes. Jesus is declaring that the kingdom of Christ does not come by worldly means. The kingdom of Christ does not come because of laws that align with the Bible. Or the kingdom of Christ does not come because of policies that align with the Bible. The kingdom of Christ does not come from the top down. You see, the president can make no one a Christian. And the policies of our federal government or any government can turn no one to Christ. The kingdom of God doesn't come from the top down. It comes from the bottom 
The kingdom of God comes when normal people like you and me live for Jesus and then decide to tell other people about Jesus. The kingdom of God comes from the bottom up. You know, what happened on Wednesday was absolutely astonishing, and it was appalling, but it does not affect Christ's kingdom. You know, here's what I pray that we see this morning. I pray that we see that we have an amazing opportunity. You see, now is actually our moment to change the world. The capital was breached because they wanted to change the country. But Christians, we of all people, actually have the ability to change the country. And here's how we change the country. We change the country when we stand unmoved by the events around us because we believe in the one true heavenly king. When we believe that the king is on his throne and we share this king with others, that's what's going to change the country. And when God's people really believe that and really live that, there will be revival. Revival will start just being honest when Christians, of all people, care more about the coming kingdom than we do the present kingdom. That's when revival will start. And what an opportunity we have. Now is the time to share this kingdom and to share our heavenly king with those who do not know him. Now is the time to get serious about that, to get serious about telling about Jesus with others. That's the church that we want to be. We want to be a church where the good news of Jesus emanates from us and emanates from this place. This morning, we're going to look at the Apostle Paul's commitment to preaching. And the Apostle Paul preached of the King Eternal in a world and in a time in which this was very, very divisive. We're going to look at the Apostle Paul. And we're going to look at how he preached. And we're going to see that the Apostle Paul says, I can't do it alone. And it's much the same today. You see, the task of preaching isn't only dependent upon the preacher. The task of preaching is dependent upon the generosity of the church. If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to the book of Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 14. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 14. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am supplied, and now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs, according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. For those taking notes this morning, first, the big idea. The big idea is this, giving to the Lord's work. These notes are on the back of your bulletin. You want to check there. Giving to the Lord's work, number one, comes from a generous response. Number two, giving to the Lord's work comes after a gracious request. And number three, giving to the Lord's work comes before a good result. Number one, giving to the Lord's work comes from a generous response. Paul preached the gospel to the people of Philippi. Paul preached that Jesus was the Son of God. Paul preached that the Son of God left heaven and earth to become a man. And Paul preached that this Jesus lived the perfect life, and then he died on the cross, the death that we deserve to die. And Paul preached that because of Jesus, our sins can be forgiven. This is the message that Paul preached. The Philippians, they heard it, and they believed it. Paul preached to them, 
And then a short time later, Paul leaves them to go to Corinth. And he goes to Corinth to do the exact same thing, to preach the message of Jesus. Paul is reflecting back upon his time with the Philippians, and he says, verse 15, you are the only church that supported me. Paul tells the church in Philippians, he says, you were so moved by the gospel, so moved by what Jesus has done for you, that you wanted to give me money so that I could tell more people about Jesus. And that's exactly what they did. And we know from the other books of the Bible that the Philippians were incredibly poor. In fact, we read in the Bible that they had extreme poverty. And it's in extreme poverty that the Philippians give money to the Apostle Paul. They give him money when he's in Thessalonica. That's over 100 miles away. 100 miles away over difficult terrain. You know, that's also a dangerous journey, carrying that much money with you. It's far away. It's dangerous. It's a lot of money for them. It's a massive undertaking. And they did it not once, but they did it twice. The Philippians church generously gave of their finances, not once, but twice in response to the good news that they had received. They were so excited about the good news of Jesus that they just instinctively realized, hey, we have to get this message out, and it's worth the sacrifice. The Apostle Paul tells the church, you supported me financially. He tells them, only you supported me financially. You know, these other churches in which Paul preached, these other people, they received the good news of Christ, and they were changed. But for some reason, they weren't moved like the Philippians. These other churches weren't moved to support the Apostle Paul financially. It was Jesus who said, where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. The Apostle Paul wants them to see that their gift is actually revealing their heart. The Apostle Paul wants them to see that their gift is revealing that their heart is with the Lord. And notice what Paul says in verse 14. He says, you were only acquainted with the gospel. These people were not Christians for many years. It's not as though they matured into the point of giving that they worked up to it. The Philippians church gave immediately, and they gave instinctually. They heard the message of Jesus, and they're excited about that message, and so they say, we want to give to the cause of spreading this message. It's instinctually. It's immediate. They're willing to sacrifice so that the message of Christ might go forth. They gave in their poverty. They gave more than one. And they gave without reluctance. Now, how did they know to help? That's our second point this morning. Giving comes after a gracious request. Paul tells the Philippians in verse 14, you shared in my troubles. You see, at some point, Paul told them, I, I need some money to take the good news of Christ to others. At some point, the Apostle Paul asked them, would you help me? Would you consider giving of your money? Now, what an awkward thing to ask. Surely some could have said to this response or to this request, they could have said, well, you're a greedy guy. Some could have said, you know, you just must be in this for the money. And yet, if Paul would have kept silent, if the Apostle Paul would have said nothing about his need, perhaps others could have said, you know, you're just relying upon yourself. You know, and that's actually a deterrent to the gospel. Some could have said, you know, if, if you would just open up your mouth, we would give you money and, and the gospel could go out to more people. You know, surely the Apostle Paul feels the awkwardness of asking for money. And yet because of Paul's number one desire to get the gospel out, Paul graciously asks for their you know, it's the same way today. Talking about giving is always an awkward thing. You know, it's a little bit awkward for me to preach on giving because your gifts pay my salary. And like the Apostle Paul, it's awkward to talk about giving because the last thing I want to communicate is that I'm somehow greedy for your cash. And yet this morning, 
I feel compelled for the sake of the gospel to make us aware that there is a real need. Last year, our church experienced a shortfall. We spent more money on missions and expenses than we received. More money went out than came in. Now, we've tried to be good financial stewards. We've tried to tighten up our belt as much as we can. Tried to be faithful. And and by the way, if you're a member of the church and you're just interested in ever seeing our financials, we are happy to get you a copy of that. And yet, truth be told, in 2021, we are expecting, if the current trend continues, to be in the same boat once again. If giving stays the same, it's possible and even likely that once again we're going to have more money going out than coming in. And yet our leadership believes, believes wholeheartedly, that it's the Lord's plan for us to advance the gospel from Haven Heights Baptist Church, even if there is a likelihood of a shortfall. Last year, 2020, it was a hard year in many ways. And yet it was a great year for ministry at Haven Heights Baptist Church. The pandemic closed our doors physically for nine weeks. And yet the gospel went forth in unprecedented ways. You know, when our doors were closed, we began a radio broadcast. And the radio goes out to a potential of over 23,000 people. Now, we have no idea how many people listen to our radio broadcast at noon on Sundays, but we know people do. And we know people do because from time to time they tell us. And last year, we started live streaming over the internet. And some of you right now are hearing the gospel of Christ this way. Due to our radio broadcast and due to our live streaming over the internet, we have new Facebook likes and new Facebook searches every day. Do you know this means on a new Facebook search, this means that people who have never searched out our church before are doing And that happens nearly every day. Nearly every day, people searching out our church for the first time. You know, it's simply unmistakable that people are being impacted by the gospel that is emanating from this church. And when all things are considered, perhaps in 2020, the gospel reached further from this church than it has ever in the past before. And that's my prayer for this coming year. My prayer for 2021 would be that the gospel would ring out clearer and further than ever. You know, the Apostle Paul, his dream, his desire was to go to Rome. He wanted to go to the world, and he wanted to preach the gospel there. And he said, hey, I want to take the gospel as far as we possibly can. That's our desire here. We want to take the gospel from Haven Heights as far as it can possibly go. This is why this morning I'm making an appeal for your help. You know, if giving stays the same, so if we just amateurize out what was given in 2020 and we project that for the entire year, we expect a shortfall in 2021 of approximately $25,000. $25,000 potential shortfall. Now that may seem like a massive number, and yet... And yet, covering that shortfall is actually quite doable. Here's just one suggestion from our leadership. If every family at Haven Heights were to give 20 more dollars a week, if every family at Haven Heights were to give 20 more dollars a week, not only would we meet this $25,000 shortfall, we would actually have a surplus. 20 more dollars a week per family would cause us to have a surplus in the new year. And so if you gave nothing in 2020, I'm just going to ask, would you consider giving $20 a week? In 2020, if you tithed, if you gave 10% of your income to the Lord's work, would you consider giving an additional $20 a week? Whatever you gave last year, would you consider giving an additional $20 a week to the work at Haven Heights Baptist Church? Now, for some of us, that will be easy. 
Some of us have money to spare. And yet, for others of us, $20 a week is too much. For some, giving $20 a week is nearly impossible. And no one here is trying to take your money. If 2020 has been a rough year for you, if your finances are tight, or if you're heavy into debt, if that's your situation, then, then giving more money to the church is probably not the right thing to do. And yet, following the biblical precedent of the Apostle Paul, I simply want to make us aware of the need. And part of that need is letting us know that any additional amount, any additional amount, especially over time, is going to make a huge difference. You know, maybe you consider Haven Heights your church home, and maybe you've never given money here before. You know, simply giving $5 or $10 or $20 a week, that'll pay a massive dividend in the end. Perhaps you're here and you say, you know, I've been blessed by this church. And so, yeah, I want to give to the Lord's work so that more people might be blessed and so that more people might hear about Jesus. And so one of the ways that we want to help in this is we want to make giving as easy as possible. And so this week, we're setting up online giving. And if you think it might be easy to give online, we want to give you that opportunity. And one of the ways that this can help is that through online giving, there's actually a button for a recurring gift. And so you can click that button to have a recurring gift, and it will deduct the, the gift whenever we set it to. So you can pick the day of the week, and you can pick whether you want it weekly or, or monthly. And so just know that that's coming. You can expect an email from, from us this coming week about that. You know, that's just another way that we just want to graciously make the request. We want to be as gracious as we can, and we want to be as honest as we can. It, it takes money to do ministry. And we pray, we, we pray that these gifts further Christ's kingdom so that the good news of Jesus may go forth. Now, third, and actually most important here, is giving comes before a good result. You know, this is where the Apostle Paul goes next. So he says, you know, only you gave. And he said, you know, I really appreciate the gift that you gave so that the, so that the gospel work can go forward. But then he spends most of his time talking about the good result. When we give to the Lord, it brings about a good result. Look at what the Apostle Paul says in verse 17. Not that I desire your gifts, but what I do desire is that it's credited to your account. Apostle Paul's primary concern isn't money. The Apostle Paul's primary concern is what the gift does in the giver. You see, in Christ's economy, when we give a gift to the Lord, it's not only a gift, it's actually an investment. Giving to the Lord is an investment investment that is guaranteed to pay future dividends. Just consider what Jesus tells his disciples. Jesus tells his disciples, store up treasures in heaven. Our gifts store up future rewards in heaven. You know, my friend and mentor, he once said it like this. He says, the Lord keeps accurate and permanent records. You know, the Lord knows to the penny every dollar that's given to the church. And he knows to the second every minute of our time that's given to his work. And he knows to the letter every encouraging word that is spoken. Our God keeps accurate and permanent records. And someday our God is going to open the book, open the book of his records, and reward his people for what we have done for him. We will certainly be rewarded in the future, but sometimes there's also a reward here and now. The book of Proverbs reminds us that the Lord regularly blesses the generous. The Lord sometimes blesses the generous with more finances so that they can be even more generous, and we've seen that at Haven Heights. We've seen that some of our most generous folks 
are also our most blessed financially. Sometimes the Lord does that. But we need to be honest, there's no promise of that. There's no guarantee that if you give money to the church that you're going to somehow get more money in return. But there is a guarantee that when we give to the Lord's work, that we can expect spiritual reward and spiritual blessing. When we give to the Lord's church, we can expect a harvest of righteousness. When we give to the Lord's church, you know, we actually have a good conscience in that. And the gift that we give to the church, it reminds us I'm doing this because I love my Lord. When we give to the church, we can expect enriched fellowship. When we give to the church, it increases our love and our concern for others in the church. And it reminds us this is my church and this is my family. And when we give to the Lord, we actually prove the scriptures to be true. And we find that we simply cannot outgive God. When we give to the Lord's church, spiritually speaking, we always receive more back than what we give. There's actually another reason to consider giving to the Lord's work. Look at verse 18. The Apostle Paul reminds us that our generosity pleases the Lord. The Apostle Paul says our gifts to the Lord are like a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to him. A fragrant offering. Think of the prayers in the tabernacle of incense. A sweet smell rising to the Lord. An acceptable sacrifice. Nothing can be better said of the child of God other than that he pleased God. You know, think of the athlete who makes the winning field goal or who sinks the three-pointer at the buzzer. And then they show the coach on the sideline. He's smiling and giving high fives. Or think of the student who does great on the test and there's the big letter A with the words that say good work. We know the thrill and the excitement of such moments. So it'll one day be for those who give to the Lord's church to meet our Lord and to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Final reason to consider giving to the Lord's church is that it's an opportunity to see the Lord's faithfulness. This is what the Apostle Paul tells them next, verse 19. And my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Now, verse 19 is actually kind of a strange verse. We would expect those who give to the church to do so out of their abundance. I have some money left over. I guess I'll give it to the church. But not these people. These people give out of their poverty. And my hunch is that when Paul received their generous gift, the Apostle Paul does some quick arithmetic. And he comes to the conclusion, you guys gave so much, you might just be concerned for your future. And that's why he says, my God will meet your needs. You know, there's no denying it. When we give money to the Lord's work, we have less money. That's just how it works. When you give money away, there's less money that you have. This is why the Apostle Paul reminds them, my God is going to meet your needs. The Apostle Paul is telling them, you don't need to worry about the future. Our God will take care of you. You know, sometimes people wrongly claim that, that giving money to the church is like seed money. That if you just give a little bit, somehow it's going to grow back in your bank account, that you're going to have more than you had even when you gave. Now, our God is a God who owns a cattle on a thousand hills, and I suppose that he could do that, but that's not Paul's thinking here. Paul is saying, because you gave money, to the work of the Lord, you're going to need the Lord to provide for you. It's the psalmist who says, I was young and now I'm old. Yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken or children begging for bread. We call our Lord rightfully so, God and Father. We pray to our Heavenly Father. We pray to the one who cares for us. And we pray to him because he generously cares for us. And he may bring material blessing into our life. But again, as we've already said, he will certainly 
give us spiritual blessing. That's what the Apostle Paul tells him. Verse 19, he says, hey, these riches are in Christ. The Apostle Paul wants us to see that when we give to Christ, we actually get more of Christ. And one of the ways that we get more of Christ is actually counterintuitive. You see, when we sacrifice for Christ, we get a small taste of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Jesus Christ is the one who left heaven to become a baby. And Jesus is the one who the hymn writer says emptied himself of all but love. Jesus gave up on fathomable riches to become like us. And when we give up a tiny bit of our riches, for the Lord, it brings into greater focus what Jesus Christ has done for us. And when we give up a portion of our riches for him, it causes us to know Christ more, to know more of his suffering, and to love Christ more. You see, one day this temporal is going to end. And this temporal is going to be placed with the eternal. For the Christian, we are simply passing through this life. And for the Christian, this life is simply a journey to the next life. This is what the Apostle Paul wants us to see after he spends all his time talking about giving. He says in verse 20, he says, To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. You see, when the people of God are faithful to God, we expect to participate in his future glory. When the people of God are faithful to God, we expect his future glory. A new heaven and a new earth. A new city and a new home. God with us. He will be our God and we will be his people. This world is not our home. And our current reality will not be our reality forever. Our current reality is the coming kingdom. So again, the plea, may we give of our finances so that all may hear of this reality and so that all may share in his glory. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you this morning that Jesus is on his throne. We praise you that Jesus is coming again and we praise you that glory we pray that you would cause us to be generous with your money. And we pray that you would cause us to be generous so that others may know this reality and so that others may share in this reality forever. Father, we pray that you'd make clear what you're calling us to do. And Father, if you're calling us to give, we pray that we would do so out of worship and we pray that we would give with cheerful hearts. We pray that any money that's given to this church would be would be used well and would be used to further your kingdom. We pray for your help. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Please stand with me. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love, at the impulse of swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Always only for my King. Take my silver and my 
my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne, it shall be thy royal throne. Now hear this benediction from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Go committed to the work of Christ. You are dismissed.